so hey, uh, oh, wait, hold on. There we go. So uh, I'm Raymond Camden. Uh, I'm a developer evangelist uh, for here. We do things with maps and routing, uh, stuff like that. If that interests you in any way at all, uh, just hit me up later and I'll be very happy to tell you more about that. Uh, if you need to reach out to me for any reason whatsoever, uh, you can find me at my blog, uh, RaymondCamden.com. And I also tweet on Twitter, because where else would you tweet, uh, at Raymond Camden. And you should absolutely follow me because I only tweet very important, uh, critical enterprise open source development type stuff. So absolutely follow me for that crucial, crucial information. So uh, I want to start off with a quick confession. Um, I want to share some honest truth with you. And that truth um, is that I struggle uh, in many aspects, <laughs> not just the aspect that I'll be talking about today. But um, yeah, I, I struggle a lot. And the, the main reason kind of boils down to the fact that I will go to your documentation. I will read your documentation. And then pretty much every single time, uh, I'm going to read it the wrong way. Uh, I am going to make some dumb mistake or uh, there'll be something in your documentation that is maybe the tiniest bit vague and my brain will like laser focus on that part and just like blow up. So I'm going to give you an example of this. And this actually involves Pillsbury Crescent Rolls. Uh, how many of you were expecting this to be part of your conference day today? Well, uh, I can say I'm a huge, huge fan of this because it's easy to make and my kids love it. And I earn like big daddy hero points for, for, for cooking this, even though it's, it's pretty trivial. Uh, but something kind of interesting happened the first time I, I, I made this for dinner. Uh, the instructions start off really kind of simple and clear, right? So preheat oven to 375, no ambiguity in that, right? Turn the oven on, set it to 375, and you're good. And it's like unroll and separate into triangles. Now, if you don't know, uh, these uh, Pillsbury things is come out like a tube of batter. And you put it down on the platter, and there's a little seam and if you kind of gently, like I have big giant hands, I tend to tear things apart. Um, but if you kind of very gently unroll it, you get like a flat sheet of the cooking batter type stuff. So far, so good, pretty easy. And then the next direction uh, is very, like very kind of weird to me. It says, I right, roll up the triangles starting at the wide end. All right, so this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, when you separate the triangles, it's the shape. So I can still remember looking at this and saying, okay, so an object is kind of wide and tall. So the wide end must be the bottom end. And so I rolled it up and it didn't quite look right. You know, it didn't look like something I was going to turn into a, a, a crescent. So then I thought, okay, so maybe it just means like the, the, the longest Part. So maybe it's this side. And when I rolled it that way, it definitely didn't make sense either. So then I, I tried this way as well. And I I froze. Like, I didn't know what to do. And, you know, I didn't want to screw up this part of dinner. Um, and you're probably laughing at me. And I'm like, you know, that's so stupid. Why, why would somebody freeze over something that is so basic? Uh, but I guarantee you that users run into this all the time. Or maybe it's just me. I, I will allow for that possibility as well. So to give you like a real example of this relating to documentation, uh, part of the reason that I'm so kind of passionate and I, I spend so much time thinking about documentation is that uh, my first example uh, working with computers uh, was an Apple IIe uh, or a 2 Plus way back uh, in 1981, 1982 or so. Um, and uh, what was kind of cool is you know, back then you got a computer, it came with a manual on how to program for it. Uh, you don't quite get that nowadays, which I think is kind of unfortunate. We're kind of missing out on things. And 
So I had just seen the movie Tron. I wanted to be a programmer so I could do stuff just like Tron. And I get this book out and I look at it and it starts off really, really simple, right? So we're gonna write a two line program uh, in basic and you could see it on screen there, line 10, print two plus three, line 20, print two minus three. Very, very simple. There's no possible way that somebody reading this could screw this up, except I did. I screwed it up. I, I did it. I ran the program and I got a syntax error. Now, I, I remember just like, like this being again, frozen. Like I, what could I do wrong when it's, it's that short of a computer program? Like, you know, certainly uh, I've done something wrong or the docs are wrong or, or something. I, I did not know what to do. So after like retyping this in like for an hour, you know, stupid me goes back to the docs. And I noticed that you know, after the, uh, the code listing, was this line, and the highlight makes it a little bit hard to read there, and it says, remember, each line must be terminated by pressing the return key. Oh yeah, and if you go back, look at my code. So you know what I did? I saw that in the book. I saw 10 print two plus three, 20 print two minus three. I typed 10 print two plus three, and then to make it look like what the book had, I hit the space bar until the cursor actually wrapped all the way around the screen and came back to the next line, and then I typed the next line. And that's why I had syntax error. So now, you know, 30 years on, I look at documentation like this, and I say, you know what, that line of text, we're gonna move that buddy before the code line. We're gonna take it out of parentheses, because in general, like my brain sees the parentheses and, and thinks that's a side note. It may not be as important as what I'm really learning. There's so many things there that could be done based on the user feedback that, that I went through. And that kind of experience, I think, really colored my, my life. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, I have continued to make those types of mistakes from, them on, from, from, from then on. And I've truly kind of got this, this, this notion in my brain that docs are really, really important. And whether it's open source or not, but I would say more so for, 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 for open source, uh, docs are really everything. So, you know, I have, through my last 30 or so years of working with multiple different products out there, I have got some opinions. Um, I wrote this up about maybe two years or so ago, and I've updated it since then a few times. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but I wrote like a treatise on like what I thought was important. And this presentation is based on this. And by the way, in the, uh, in the chat channel, I share the URL for the slide deck and I'll do so when I'm done as well. Uh, if you wanna grab the slides and get the links and stuff like that. So uh, I also wanna do a quick apology. Um, I'll be calling out some companies that I like and some open source projects that I like for mistakes. Uh, because these are real live examples of things that I see wrong out there. So uh, sorry, but also kind of not sorry as well. And I'll, I'll point out that pretty much every mistake that I'm pointing out is probably something that I have done myself. So if we start with a basic rule, and that is documentation is required, that seems really, really obvious. Everyone in the room is probably saying, yeah, yeah, of course documentation is required. Uh, but in 2020, I feel like we still need to say this because I still see projects that will say, all right, documentation is nice. Uh, we don't necessarily need to do it. Or we could ship a product or ship a feature and just document it at some later time. And I just think that is like a cardinal sin. Um, and in fact, uh, I, I, I blog a lot. Uh, so uh, I've had my blog up since 2003. Uh, I try to blog about once a week, but I typically do about 10 blog entries a month. So I'm always blogging. And in general, like I will not blog about something that's not documented. So if you tell me, hey, here's our product and it has this cool feature, but not documented yet, but I'll, 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 you know, I'll tell you how it works. I just typically won't even talk about it on my blog because I don't want people out there to have to suffer through 
you know, trying to find out how something works. So part of having a good open source project is making documentation required and actually making that in it, making that a rule, you know, don't literally just say that, but actually kind of make it part of the process. So if you're adding uh, some particular new feature, you know, typically folks are used to saying, you know, part of that will be running a test framework for that feature. Uh, part of the process will be doing a security check to make sure we haven't opened any holes in our product or exposed data of uh, some sort. Uh, but certainly in that same checklist, there should be a line item for having the documentation written. And even better, uh, if it's somebody who didn't actually work on that particular feature, uh, you know, somebody else on the project per se, uh, have them come in, have them look at what you did, have them look at your rough notes, uh, for example, and from that, uh, actually write the documentation. Uh, being that you perhaps actually built something, you are extremely familiar with it and may not be aware of the inherent knowledge that you have about how this works that people who are new to the project won't necessarily have. So if you're lucky enough to be on an open source project that has more than one person, first of all, you're lucky. Uh, but second of all, you know, look at having somebody else uh, do the documentation for what you wrote. And at the end of the day, um, you know, we want well-written, perfect documentation, uh, but I will absolutely take documentation written by uh, maybe someone who doesn't know English very well, I'll take that uh, any time over no documentation at all. Uh, as just some more kind of things to think about in terms of making documentation required, I did some checking to see uh, what kind of ways that were uh, out there to kind of enforce that. I couldn't really find a way to say, you know, on this project, if I add code in this particular folder, then I have to have a corresponding piece of documentation as well. I couldn't find a way to automate that. There are things that are kind of related to it. TextLint, for example, uh, will look at uh, your documentation and look for things like uh, terminology that may not be explained. Uh, it'll look for gendered content. So if you say things like he does this, it'll kind of flag that as, as something that you may want to look at. So it's not really for you know, making sure you did right, but can look at the quality of your documentation and try to make it a little bit nicer. Uh, Swagger, I will say, uh, I saw just on their website, uh, they seem to have something in their process for uh, ensuring that you actually write something. I only know a little bit of Swagger, uh, but I'll just share that as something that you may want to look at if you are uh, already using Swagger in your particular projects. The other aspect that uh, comes to mind to me a lot is what to include in your documentation and also when to include it. So the answer to what to include, uh, you may just want to say, hey, we should include everything, right? Because, you know, there's nothing wrong with giving the user too much text, right? Nothing can go wrong with that. Well, I have a great counter example uh, to my why you may want to reconsider how much you put out there. Uh, about two jobs or so ago, I worked at, at uh, Off Zero, and I was in the group that worked on a project called WebTask. WebTask was a really, really cool project. It was one of the easiest way to build serverless functions. Uh, you could do it all online, had a great editor. Um, you know, in terms of working with serverless, it was one of the easiest solutions out there. Uh, unfortunately, they had to shut it down because uh, Bitcoin miners were making use of it to Bitcoin mine or mine Bitcoin, whatever they do. Uh, but the documentation, at least when I started there, had this little interesting issue. So it had a great kind of getting started uh, that really did kind of get you up and running in 30 seconds. It got you an easy win, which is something I'm going to get back to in uh, a few minutes. It started off really good. Now, I, I typically will start on page one in the documentation and then go to page two and you know so forth. Starts off good. And then the very next page is extensibility in a multi-tenant platform. Um, when I joined the company, I didn't know what multi-tenant was. 
And, you know, I kind of went into web testing, oh, it's a way to make serverless functions. And then it starts talking about running untrusted customer code and multi-tenants and a, and a trading platform. And everything that was on this page was true information. Um, it was useful to somebody, but absolutely not useful to me in terms of you know, actually learning how to use this particular product. And then it only got worse going to the third page. I remember thinking, okay, this is not for me. I'll just skip ahead. And then the next page, you know, I think if you see an Aristotle quote, then already, you know, already you're kind of like having a red flag up there. Like what the heck is going on here? And this particular page uh, was talking about client server programs and architecture and all that. And again, factual information, yeah. Uh, you know, client server stuff is old, I, I, I get that. But nothing in that is actually helping me use web tasks. Uh, you know, and I don't really care per se about what happened in the 60s. So one of the things that I did uh, while I was at the company was to kind of look at the documentation and then come back later and deploy a much slimmer version of that where we still had that getting started. Uh, you know, we had a good simple intro for that quick win and then immediately went into, you know, actually writing serverless functions. So we had the programming model and uh, the main thing passed into your serverless function was a context object. So that, that was the very next topic. And uh, one of the things that people typically would want to do is pass parameters. And the easiest way to do that was via query string. So that was the next topic. So I pretty much got rid of anything that didn't pertain to actually learning how to use web tasks uh, and focused more on uh, you know, the actual nuts and bolts of working with this particular product. And I will pause for a dramatic moment to have a sip of water. So in terms of, you know, when do you actually include something? So, you know, if you've determined that I do need to document, you know, X and Y, uh, what should come first and, you know, what should I put in front of the user first? So I, in my mind, I kind of make two buckets in terms of using a product. There are things that you have to know. And typically that's a much smaller bucket. So like you, you have to install the product to actually use it. You have to do the NPM install to, to grab it down. Uh, but then there's a whole set of things that you may want to do that, that you may even never do. So in general, uh, I tend to focus on, you know, what do I need to do to do anything at all and get that information to the user up front. So when I'm looking at a project in general, let's say it has no documentation at all, um, I absolutely love to start uh, with a, you know, kind of quick introduction of some sort of explaining what it is. And that could literally be like two sentences, depending on the size of the project that I'm working on. Uh, talk about the installation, and this could be complex, uh, but in terms of a new user coming to my site, I will typically prefer to focus on the most simplest and direct uh, installation route. And as a counterexample, and let me just open this up, and let me just see. Yes, all right. Wasn't sure if the new tab was showing up as well. Uh, this is Beautify. I like Beautify a lot, uh, but its installation docs are, are very, very extensive and to me a bit overwhelming as well. So you have a CLI install, you have a Nuxt install, you have Webpack, you have Electron, you have PWA, you have Cordova, you have Capacitor. Um, and everything here is useful. It's, it's factual, uh, but I would possibly suggest in the quick start, it's a bit overwhelming. So I think the quick start in this example, it would have been great to have just a CLI install because that would apply to everybody or it would apply to someone who was learning to beautify and wants that hello world, that, that kind of quick demo up and running. And then perhaps have a whole second section just on installation and even call it installation techniques where each of these different ones is listed out, you know, perhaps in order of what the most common one is. So 
uh, you know, PWA is probably more important than Electron or Cordova, I would have that uh, higher up in that particular chain in case you could see right there. Again, my, my personal preference. So again, I like it getting started. I like uh, giving the person that quick win uh, so that they feel that, that, that they've done something with them. So the quicker that I can get you to get my, my particular project installed and get it showing the shiny fun thing on screen, uh, I think that's better for that user and encourages them to, to carry on. And then after that, everything else. And everything else, again, the order could be, you know, based on what you think is important. So uh, this is View Router. Uh, and what I discovered is that getting started actually like met like 50% of my use cases. Like I stopped there because uh, for the first couple of projects I used, that's all I needed. And it took me a while before I needed to, to do anything more and I was able to kind of jump ahead, for example, programmatic navigation. I remember I needed that before dynamic route matching, before nested routes. Um, but because the getting started kind of gave me that inherent knowledge of what I needed, I was kind of good to go from there. But wait, <laughs> and so I am going to contradict myself a bit as well. Uh, when you kind of think about how people read your docs, don't forget that they absolutely will also come to your docs and not start at getting started. Uh, so for example, um, if you Google for Stripe API products, uh, you will end up on this particular page. And I'm just verifying in the room. Yep, it's showing up there. Okay, so uh, by the way, I really like Stripe a lot. So I mentioned earlier, I was gonna pick on a you know, people a few times, this is an example of it. So, um, and in fact, our particular docs from my company, we made the same exact mistake that I'm showing here. So Google sent me to the right place in terms of uh, the Stripe API for products. But the big thing that I see missing here is that I have no idea what the URL is for this endpoint. I see it's definitely slash one V1 slash products, but somebody said, hey, you know what? We only have one root URL. Let's include that at, at the very beginning and don't repeat it every single time. However, because I didn't come in via the front door, I don't know what that URL is. Now, obviously I could find it, I could scroll up. Uh, this will stop me for five seconds at the most. Uh, but just visually looking at this particular uh, box here with the endpoints, there's a lot of space there. You could probably fit that URL in there uh, and just save me that five or six seconds. They also make another mistake here uh, that again, our docs uh, have this issue as well in some places where it's actually pretty easy to get to that full URL if I just click on that V1 products. I didn't know that. And the reason I didn't know that is because unlike tradition, there's no underline for that link. Now we've been kind of trained where we know that if I see a navigation on the left-hand side, I'm pretty sure those are links. And the plain text paragraph you see here in the middle, uh, the different colors stands out as you know links. Over here on the right-hand side, it was white text with no underline. I really did not know. And again, I could be dumb. Uh, I didn't know that I could click on that and then get to uh, the uh, link. It was only when I scrolled my mouse over uh, that I actually noticed that. So just something to keep in mind as well. So in terms of code samples, uh, yes, you know, if we're talking about open source technology projects that typically involves code. Uh, you normally want to actually have a code sample, but it's an important question to think about how much you want to include. So as an example, uh, I wanted you to imagine that I'm trying to teach you about the placeholder option for a form field. So one way that I could do that would be to show you an HTML page. So this is a full HTML page. It has a header and the body, uh, the full form, all the attributes. This is a proper good HTML page, thumbs up to me and yada, yada, yada. However, you know, I, if I'm teaching you about placeholder, the code that's actually relevant to my knowledge is a very small part of this particular page. So I may consider doing something a bit simpler, like only showing the form 
Or I could say, you know, if you've come in here because you're learning about form tricks or I have a, a library that's related to making forms easier to use, it's probably safe to assume that you already know about form syntax and I can focus just on the aspect that I'm actually modifying. And in this case, the input type. Now, I want to be clear that I, I'm not saying that you should absolutely bring it down to the smallest part. You just want to give some thought to the balance between what you're teaching, uh, you know, what your docs are illustrating at that particular point, and the rest of the code in that particular block. You, know, you want to think about you know, how much the user is going to have to parse. You know, you can like, if, if you go back to that first example, uh, your brain is going to work like a web browser and kind of parse that. And, you know, they have to find the part that's important for them to learn what's going on here. So things that you could do to make that a bit easier could be nice. Um, I think Vue does an amazing job at this where, you know, all their examples typically involve JavaScript and HTML. They could do a complete HTML page with a script block at the bottom, uh, but instead they have two, uh, two code blocks, and hopefully y'all can see it. Uh, it's a bit uh, faded, but does say HTML on the top block and JS on the second block. They did that, and they, they understood that, you know, if you're a Vue developer, you most likely are past the point of building a basic HTML page. I don't have to show you the HTML tag, the head tag, the body tag, et cetera. And much like if you're learning uh, Vue, then you should know JavaScript ahead of time. I don't have to show you that this is, you know, so-and-so.js file or that it's within a uh, particular script block, for example. So I think they do a really good job here uh, in kind of, you know, highlighting the important parts and not making you read noise, you know, valid HTML or valid JavaScript, but they're getting rid of the noise and then kind of focusing more on uh, the crucial bits. So uh, I would say like one of the best things that you could do is include that short snippet, uh, but then link to a full example where you do have full HTML pages and things like that. Uh, GIST is pretty good for that. Uh, but I think CodePen is probably the best because the person can actually run the code and then uh, modify it. They could tweak it. So, you know, instead of hello world, I could say hello Ray. Um, and, you know, that makes the user feel powerful um, and then allows them to kind of go beyond what your docs have and actually start uh, playing with it as well. Uh, I tend to use code sandbox only in cases where there's like a build process of some sort. So if I'm doing a simple view blog post, I'll use code pin. If it's a more enhanced view application, I'll use code sandbox. And again, that's just my particular way of, of uh, using those particular tools. Uh, if you are showing code uh, blocks, try to use a code formatter. Uh, I use Prism on my blog. Uh, I'm using reveal.js for the slide deck and it uses highlight.js. Uh, both of these make it pretty easy to use. Uh, you basically you know, wrap uh, your blocks of code and then the, the library comes in and makes it look a bit nicer. So in terms of things to avoid, <laughs> don't do a picture of code. Um, again, yeah, I have many things on the, I have many things on this slide deck that I feel are like super obvious and that I, I shouldn't have on here, but then day to day, I, I still run into people doing this. And the other one is code you can't copy. And I saw this last week where for some reason, the, the CSS was set up to prevent me from copying some code off a page. Now, I know what happened in that case. Uh, somebody did a CSS change uh, to make something else look nice, and the side effect was preventing me from copying code from a web page. And that's the kind of thing where I would say, hey, you know what? Uh, you know, that particular UI enhancement made sense. But if you're making it more difficult for me as a developer, I would rather it look a little bit uglier uh, and then actually have the ability to, to copy. By the way, um, don't do stuff that changes people's clipboard. Uh, there's almost never a reason to do that. Um, I'll, I'll mention an example in a bit about why you would want to, but don't do that stupid thing where you copy text from a web page and then you change it so that when they paste it, it says, paste it from blah, blah. Yeah, just, just don't do that, especially for developer documentation. 
Another consideration, uh, this is from the Eleveny documentation. Uh, I love the Eleveny. Eleveny, it's a static site generator. It's the one I use for my blog. It's the best thing ever invented ever. Uh, but from their quick start, there's something a little bit interesting in here. So they have this command, echo, single quote, pound, you know, yada, yada, yada. So if you do this and then look at the output uh, when you run Eleveny to get the generated output, you actually get incorrect output. And the only reason that you do is because the echo command, the one that they have on screen here, uh, works differently on Windows versus Linux. Now, I know that everyone loves their MacBook Pros. Um, everyone loves OS X. I love Ubuntu. I use that on Windows. Uh, but there are a few people, one or two, uh, who use Windows, who use command.exe, who use PowerShell. And I cannot tell you how many projects I see where they just assume that that you know or that you're on Unix and that you, if you're not, then you know what the equivalent command is. Another one I see quite often as well is to use touch. Touch does not work on Windows. So, you know, it's a minor thing. Like if you say, hey, touch this file um, with the assumption that it makes a blank file to use later. Um, if I see that, I know. And also, I'm on Ubuntu on Windows, so it's not really an issue. But simple, small things like this can stop a user and stop them from reading. You know, kind of imagine the deer and head headlights type thing that you don't want developers to go through. Another great example, uh, this is from a company called Pipe Dream, uh, another service I think is pretty cool. Uh, they have a curl command, and it is delimited after over two lines. And if I copy and paste this into Windows, I'm sorry, uh, if I do, I get an error. Windows actually does support multi-line uh, commands, but it's a uh, carrot, I think. It's the hat, it's the hat symbol, uh, which will work in command.exe. Unfortunately, it doesn't work in PowerShell. Uh, so when I Googled this, uh, there is a way to make it work in PowerShell, but it was so weird. I was like, yeah, nope, I'm just not gonna bother doing a slide for it. Uh, but again, it's, it seems so minor, like, oh, a user won't mind. They'll, they'll know what to do. Uh, but at the same time, you know, do the right thing. Make, make it work. You know, find an example. So um, I forget what documentation. Oh, right, Spotify. There we go. It's on the screen. Uh, so they basically, they, they made the curl command readable, uh, but it's not using something that would break on my system. Now, by the same token, uh, it's not copy and pasteable, or if it is, I have to copy two times. Uh, but I think that's a good balance. Now, a few minutes ago, I mentioned never mess with somebody's clipboard. Uh, last week, I actually blogged an example where you could present something like this on screen, have a copy command, and when it copies, it copies it as one line. So the, the person could actually paste that into any operating system that supports curl. Uh, and not to worry about line breaks. So a quick recap of what I said so far, you absolutely, you absolutely want to have a policy where docs are required. I really think it needs to be spelled out because if you don't spell it out, people won't do it. Um, and again, I absolutely to this day see projects where they just don't care if something is documented. Uh, think about what you should document and when and also, you know, give good thought to your organization of uh, when you present information. So that's kind of some high level things to consider. I have a couple of uh, last set of tips to share with you. Kind of my pet peeves or kind of smaller things to think about. So animated GIFs, everyone loves animated GIFs. Uh, I hate them. This is a great example. And I'm not sure how well this is going to stream, but this is a CLI command that will print an animated GIF to your terminal. And in this animated GIF, the CLI command is actually on screen for about one second. And then the GIF is on screen for eight seconds. I can't tell you how many things I've come across where they had a good example in the GIF, not in the text. And I wanted to try what they did because that's, that's how I learn, right? You, you, you talk about a feature, I want to run it myself and have to wait for the damn animated GIF to cycle. Or it goes so fast, you know, that they're showing like four arguments, I type in one, I wait, I type in another one, and I wait. 
Uh, I just, in general, I would say try to avoid uh, animated GIFs and documentation as much as possible. In this particular example, I would have had the command and then just a screenshot uh, of the animated GIF or an animated GIF of just the GIF being rendered, not the command on screen. So yeah, animated GIFs, just, just don't do it, do it, don't do it. Uh, in terms of jokes, when I give presentations, you know, less so online because you can't see people and you can't see if they're groaning or smiling or laughing. Uh, I tend to include a lot of jokes in my documentation. I rarely, rarely joke because, you know, I think I'm a pretty silly person. Even at 47, I still feel like I'm silly and lighthearted. Uh, but when it comes to docs, I kind of just want to get things done. So I will rarely use jokes in my technical documentation. I will do like nerdy things in my code samples. So I'll use names like Luke Skywalker uh, for a, a, a you know variable name or a variable value or stuff like that. I'll typically express my creativity uh, in sample data and stuff like that. And in the actual text, uh, keep the joking to a caution. In blog posts, I'm a bit more looser, uh, but in docs, I, you know, I understand that you're probably struggling to get something done Friday at 5 p.m. and you don't want the humor. Uh, required login, I have seen this a couple of times where a person's project was so crucial that they want you to log in to actually read the docs. Just don't do that. That's not so much an issue with open source projects. I have never seen that with open source, but I just bring that up uh, to, to say, don't, don't ever even consider doing that. Um, and I will say, you know, going back to that, I'm willing to bet that most of the time when you see that, somebody had a KPI for their manager to say, we need you know user signups. They're like, oh, I know. I know a great way to get people to sign up. I'll force them to sign up just to look at our docs. So yeah, uh, don't do that. Uh, offer a way to, uh, to have people help out and make it kind of obvious. Uh, one of the simplest ways is to have a link to GitHub to edit. And I have an example here. This is the native script view documentation on the introduction. And if you scroll down, you'll see a link, improve this document. And if you click it, you go to the GitHub markdown page for this. And GitHub, to their credit, has done really great work to make this as painless as possible. I use Git every single day, but if I had to fork your project just to fix a typo via the CLI, honestly, I probably wouldn't do it. Like it feels like a lot of work. GitHub has made this as painless as clicking the edit, it will fork it for you, you do your edit, it then is like, hey, do you want to do a PR? It's right here. Just click this next button. It like holds your hand throughout the whole process and makes it very painless uh, to do uh, an improvement like that. That being said, uh, still improve, uh, still uh, add some form of contact form, you know, some way for, for, for a person to reach out so that they can write you an email and say, hey, there's a typo on this page. Please fix it. That way, if they don't have a GitHub account, uh, they could still send you that quick feedback. By the way, a Twitter link is not a feedback form. It's not the same. Uh, if you are lucky to have people, <laughs> more than one person on your project, then you know, look at having somebody be the official talks, uh, docs person. This is great for the less technical aspect uh, of your organization. So someone who may not be a hardcore programmer, but like me, who struggles a lot, I would be perfect to write your docs because every every possible thing that could go wrong, I will find it and I will have that problem and I'll make sure the docs cover people like me. Uh, in terms of formats, uh, course HTML, uh, but look at supporting offline usage because one of the first things I think about is that, oh, this project is great. I'm getting on an airplane. Yeah, pretend that we still fly. You know, I know we don't fly anymore. Uh, I'm getting on an airplane. I, I wish I had a way to get this on the airplane so I could still hack without paying 15 bucks for poor Wi-Fi. Uh, so if you do have like a PWA offline support for your docs, actually tell the user that. Don't just do it. Like tell them someplace like, hey, we're using fancy PWA technology to support this offline. It's done. 
do that. Uh, look at Swagger if you're doing anything for APIs. Uh, and then uh, also look at PDF. Now, I know it's probably like, oh, PDF, really? Um, but for uh, large sets of documentation, I just find PDF a bit easier to read. So if you're at the point of having a couple hundred pages of documentation, which is definitely possible, uh, PDF gives me one nice file, definitely with offline support, uh, that could be a bit easier on the eyes. Uh, and also, I kind of like having a PDF open and having a, a web browser open for my work, the PDF of the docs, my browser while I do stuff. So uh, in terms of what next, uh, I would highly suggest checking out writethedocs.org. It's an entire organization just about writing documentation with a huge amount of resources. Uh, you absolutely want to check that out. And with that, uh, I am going to look back on the screen <coughs> and see if I can see uh, some questions. And by the way, so uh, I am going to go from the backward to the, from the bottom up. I've seen a few people mention Open API. I absolutely should have mentioned that alongside with Swagger. I apologize. Um, thank you, Matthew Foley. Uh, Lynn Floyd, my favorite language, I'm primarily JavaScript or English. That answers both of your questions, I think. Um, I'm seeing some talks about Hopin. Cool. Oh, and I, I, I told you all I would share the slide URL on GitHub. Uh, uh, Lynn, markup. Yeah, I like markup a lot too. Um, Visual Studio Code makes it much, much easier to work with. Uh, Mateus, I apologize if I said your name incorrectly. I have not used Gitbook, so I can't comment on that. In terms of uh, Carl, in terms of platforms, uh, I really like the way GitHub will, will serve HTML and markdown files without having to think about hosting at all. So if you're using GitHub already for your documentation, you have a built-in HTML viewer, I guess is a way of saying it for that. For static sites in general, which is typically how I would build documentation, uh, I would look at Netlify. Uh, that's where I serve my, uh, my blog. Cool. Uh, Noemi uh, says that Pandoc will do Markdown to PDF. I've not gone from Markdown to PDF before. That's pretty nice. I've done HTML to PDF, not Markdown to PDF. That's pretty cool. Uh, Camille, uh, so I have a degree in technical writing. Uh, it was an English degree with a focus on technical writing. But right out of college, I went into the web industry where I did kind of everything. So... I never got a job as a technical writer. So unfortunately, I can't really help with that. Uh, certainly having a lot of examples helps. Um, again, I use my blog as a way to have an online presence for my technical writing. And that, I believe, helped me uh, get jobs writing books and writing articles and, and, and things like that. Uh, for those who may not have a blog, uh, take a look at uh, Practical Dev or dev.to that in. Uh, they have a blogging platform that's very friendly to developers, not like Medium, um, and would get you up and writing right away. Very easy to use editor, very great interface, and free. I actually blog on Dev.2 as well, but it's like a reblog from my personal blog, if that makes sense. And no one has asked, but yes, that is a uh, Death Star behind me. <laughs> the croissants are fine. I still like. I still struggle. I still like stop for a second. Uh, but what I what I've turned what I found out is that the kids don't care how croissanty they look or how crescenty they look. 
uh, they just eat it. So, yeah. Yeah, I'll scoot over a little bit. You can see more Legos. Yeah, if there was an easy way to turn my webcam around, I would show you the rest of the uh, office. Uh, it's a little bit full. Amy, uh, I won't speak for the organizers, but I'm pretty sure they said that they were going to make everything available later, especially since there's so many sessions going on at once. So I am 99% sure that it is uh, being recorded and will be available later. YouTube channel, there we go. By the way, thank you to everyone who listened. Um, I'm just gonna hang out here for the next few minutes uh, and try to answer any more questions, but uh, thank you for, for hearing me out. I definitely appreciate it. You're all welcome as well. You are all welcome. My contact information one more time. On Twitter, I'm Raymond Camden, and blog is RaymondCamden.com. Wesley, I think it's one of those things where, like, until you feel the pain yourself, it's hard to understand. Um, I think, you know, it may be it may be indicative of the web community where there's so many of us that don't have a traditional background. Uh, there's so many of us who come from English, uh, the social study, you know, the, the uh, liberal arts, for example, versus pure hardcore engineering. Uh, there, you know, for us, documentation, I think, may be a bit more, you know, a bit more apparent. Um, you know, it's, it's being a clarion call. Uh, I know at my organization, you know, I love my company. We're not perfect. But at my company, we, you know, those of us in, in uh, developer relations, we look at it as like our, our primary goals to ensure our docs are clear. And we we nag engineering. If they, excuse me, if they put something out there that, that's not clear, that can be such a small little, small little point. We will be able to harp on that. Like you have to make the docs clear. You have to make uh anything that's obscure or anything that could be misread, like we have to do a great job on that. And I think that they get it. I think that it's not their, you know, the thing they think about all the time. And so that's where can we come in and think about the user in terms of, you know, ensuring that that is, is done. Um, you know, outside of making clear that this is how someone comes to your product, this, you know, you're, you know, it may be open source, but you still have a product. You still want people to use what you have built. You want them to contribute to, to what you have built. So having the documentation makes it easier for them to onboard and encourages them to actually do something to help out. So, so Wesley, I would think uh, that harp on that, like in your class, when you want to talk about documentation, that's a perfect way. Like, here's a live example. Right now, we are struggling because the last semester didn't document this. And if, if I was you, I would find a project like that, like just leave it alone, fork it, keep it there, and then use that every class. All right, let's actually use this. Oh, no, we can't because... They didn't document how to do something. Bam, that, that's your lesson, like right there. 
Thank you, Thomas. You are all welcome. So I'm not sure exactly how to end this. I know the next session is like in three or so minutes. So I assume most of y'all gonna hop out. Um, again, I'm gonna thank everyone who's still here. And I'm going to hit the leave button. I think an organizer will tell me not to if I'm not supposed to. Uh, and again, you'll have my contact information if you need something to just ask. And I will stop sharing. And still my face. So bye. <laughs>